Amen. Well, let's start with our reading before Brother Schwarzler comes. If you'd open your Bibles to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2. And he's going to be covering four verses this evening. Verses 9, 10, 11, and 12. So 1 Peter, chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. And once you've found that, I'll ask you to follow along silently while I read out loud. 1 Peter 2, verses 9 through 12. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation." This is the word of the Lord. Brother Schwarzler, if you'd come, preach for us. God bless you. And I'd say one thing I'm thankful for is that we're able to be here in a church on a Wednesday evening worshiping the Lord. But uh, by now you should be in uh, 1 Peter 2. The title of this message, I've entitled it, The Comparison Commission. Now, Pastor Knopp, I believe it was, that uh, spoke last week, and he had mentioned in the verse before, uh, in verse 8, and a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them, which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. So the verses today build off of that verse. So uh, that verse is talking about the dis- those that are disobedient to the word of God and are unsaved. And then you have, starting in verse 9, but ye. So this is not talking about the unsaved person anymore. It is talking about the Christian. And it starts out, but ye are a chosen generation. So we all are part of that ye because we're Christians. So we're a chosen generation. Christians are chosen for the purpose God has of seeing the lost saved. That is what our goal in life should be, to please God and to see the lost saved by that. And uh, this is a general calling to the ministry similar to the Great Commission. And the Great Commission in Matthew uh, chapter 28, it says, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel. Uh, uh, go ye into, uh, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So that verse and these verses. They have a similarity. They're both calling us to go uh, to reach the lost because we are chosen by God and set apart to do His will. And continuing on in verse 9, it says, a royal priesthood. We are a royal priesthood. In Galatians chapter 4, Verse 7, the Bible reads, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. And uh, this 
that royalty uh, is what we have through God. It's not of ourselves. We have no royalty in us save from what we have because of Christ, saving us from our sins and making us right with God. And because of that, we can be a royal priesthood. Now, priests, they told people what the will of God was, what God desired for them to do, how they could please God, and how if they were uh, in times of turmoil or something like that, how they could make themselves right with God. And this is a furtherance of the calling that was mentioned. We are to do that because we are a royal priesthood. We can freely talk to God and we must tell others. And we ought to do that. Uh, we can tell people what the will of God is. If they're unsaved, the will of God for their life is to see them saved before it's everlasting too late so they do not die and go to hell and burn for all of eternity. That is the will of God. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And we are a royal priesthood. Our job is to go out through the power of Christ and to tell, to shout out, to proclaim that God's will is for them to be saved. <clears throat> Continuing on in verse 9, it says, A holy nation. So we are a holy nation. Now, this is not talking about the United States or even Israel. Now, the United States, uh, you can definitely tell that because sadly our nation is so uh, into the wickedness of the world that from once it was a Christian nation, it is not that anymore or at least not as it was. But in this verse, the holy nation that it is talking about is Christians. So it is talking about the unity Christians have or ought to have. In uh, verse 10, the Bible says, which in times past were not a people, but are now a people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So, uh, in verse 9, with it saying, we are a holy nation. In verse 10, it shows that before, there was no unity between us, but now we have unity because God unifies us. We have the common goal of seeing God glorified in our lives. And not only does it say, that we are a nation. It says that we're a holy nation. So God is our goal, and pleasing God is our goal. And if we are to be holy, that means we have to be confessing our sins to Christ, having the Holy Spirit work through us, and have his cleansing on our life so that we become more Christ-like. And that... As we become more Christ-like, we become better witnesses. And as we become better witnesses, we see the things in our lives that could uh, be improved upon. So we talk to the Holy Spirit and uh, have God work in our lives. And by that, we become uh, the holy nation here. I mean, we are a holy nation set apart unto God, but it is also something that it's something we ought to strive for because of our sin nature. We do not do what we ought to for the Lord, but giving ourselves to the Lord as we ought, uh, that changes everything. So you see, see that more in verse number 11, but uh, before we get there, it says that we are a peculiar 
people. So have you ever noticed whenever you're handing out a track or uh, telling someone about the gospel, people look at you weird? Yeah. That is unnatural. Uh, but the thing is, we know that God wants us to do it. And so we, we're, we ought to tell everyone that we know with a passion, knowing that if we don't tell them and they don't get saved, that they're going to burn in hell. And we, as Christians, should not want that. I would much rather be called peculiar or weird for giving out the gospel than to have thousands of people or hundreds of people's blood on my hands for not reaching out to them with the gospel. Continuing on in verse 9, it says, That ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So, in that part of the verse, it says, we are to praise the Lord so that the unsaved notice. Uh, and uh, you see more of that later on, but uh, in verse number 9, it says that we should show forth his praise. And every single one of us was a sinner on our way to hell until Christ uh, sent someone to witness to us, to see us saved. And every one of us in here that are Christians, everyone that's watching on the live stream, you can praise the Lord because you are not on your way to hell. He pulled you out of the miry clay, out of the darkness of sin, and he put you, God put you on the path of righteousness. And that is something that is so amazing, something that we did not deserve and we do not deserve, but yet God is gracious and merciful to us sinners, and he gives us something to praise him about because our wickedness and sin before we came to the Lord, that should have kept us from the peace of God. And yet, he sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross, the most painful death of all time, and pay for our sins. And we should praise the Lord for that. And if we truly believe that, we'll be telling others about the gospel so that they can know that same glory that comes from the Lord, that same happiness. And... You can praise the Lord. And if you uh, go around in a place that it's all gloomy and stuff, but you have the Lord in there, and you just have a smile, some people will notice, and they'll ask you, what's different about you? And see, that's what I believe the Bible here is getting at. Because uh, it's saying that we should show the praises of God. And you see this even more so in verse number 11. But in verse 10 it says, Which in times past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So we already said that this uh, helps to clarify and to show that we are unified in Christ. But it also says that before we were saved, we had no mercy upon us. So we would have died and gone to hell, and God would have been perfectly justified in that because we are all sinners. But God was merciful to us, and we have obtained mercy, and he has saved us from our sins. In verse number 11, the Bible says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. So it says here, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims. 
We are not of this world. We're just pilgrims and strangers. Just like uh, it says in Hebrews chapter number 11. We are not of this world, but we are of God's. So we should act like it. We should not be able to act like the world acts. We should be able to uh, go and teach and tell others about the gospel. And they should be able to tell, hey, there's something different about that guy. He doesn't do the things we do. He doesn't swear. He don't cuss. Uh, he don't drink or do any of that stuff. And that, if someone sees that, they know something's different. And it shows that we are strangers and pilgrims upon this earth. But the Bible says, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. So if you're not doing that and you're uh, just going into your fleshly lust, the world will be like, oh, he's just one of us. That is so sad. It should never be said of a Christian that they act like the world. Yet, in America today, it's commonplace. And that is something that is so sad. But the Bible says, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. By uh, Webster's definition, uh, essentially, th this fleshly lust is any desire to possess anything over what God has for you. And that is something that you really got to think about uh, because you want the will of the Lord to be done. But if you want something that is good or something that's bad more so than you want the will of the Lord, that's a fleshly lust. It shows that you love sin more than you love God. That ought not to be. As Christians, we should be setting the example of the Bible lived out in our lives. We should be showing Christ in everything that we do, in all of our actions. And we should be leading people to Christ and doing everything that the Bible says to do. But in America today, you're not seeing that as Christianity as a whole. And that is so sad. We need to change in America to become more like the Bible says. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. And this war against the soul, it makes you less like Christ. As Christians, we're supposed to be growing closer to Christ. And the more we go closer to Christ, the more that we please him, the more that we do what he has for us. But it all is about pleasing the Lord. And if we're not doing that, and we're going away from God, and that is something it should not be said of Christians, that they're going away from God. No, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be in the Bible and doing what the Bible says, and it should be shown in your life. But if you don't abstain from the fleshly lusts of the world, and you let uh, those things enter into your life and permeate and grow, you will blend in with the world and it will be something that is sad, a detriment. And you will be very difficult to be used of the Lord. Now the Lord can use anyone, but it would be a lot more difficult for him to use someone like that, that is given in to those fleshly lusts. In verse number 12, you see an appearance. And uh, the Bible says, Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, that they may, uh, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. So here you're seeing the fact that fleshly lusts 
are something that aren't, is not good. The fleshly lusts that war against the soul cause you to be less effective in witnessing. Your life should show Christ so that the lost recognize that there is a difference. And that is something that is getting lost in American Christianity today. Because you're like, oh, let's have a rock concert and call it worship. I mean, uh, there are some songs that might be uh, worship, but it's not done in a God-glorifying way. And there, a church service that does not revolve around the Bible is not a godly church service. And a person's life who does not revolve around the Bible, they are not living out the life, their life as what the Lord would have for them. They are giving in to the fleshly lusts, and their fleshly lusts are obscuring Christ in their lives. And it makes them look as the world. Over the past uh, decade, I've been to many wing places with multiple groups of people. One group uh, I went with, they witnessed to the waitress and still had fun praising the Lord and left a Christ-like impression there. Another group I went with, they acted like the world. They were vulgar and did not witness and did not show a Christ-like testimony. Which do you think was more effective in reaching the lost? The first one. And as Christians, that's what we ought to be. We should be like the first ones, not the second ones. And the sad thing is, a lot of us do not put God in a precedent so that he is greater above all things, so that everything we do is from a desire to please him. And if you don't do that, it, you start to appear as the world. And that's so sad. And it's something that should not be, yet it is. The Bible says that uh, they will be more open to becoming a Christian by seeing how you act. So if you act like the world and you don't witness and they can't tell anything different, they're going to be like, oh, Christianity? It's just uh, something the, uh, that a group of people do. They're, it's fake. That's so sad. But you see that sediment uh, growing because of Christians that claim the name of the Lord that don't act like it or people that believe they're saved and aren't truly saved, but they've been told that they were saved and they just act like the world. And that is something that is so sad because someone who believes that they're saved and truly isn't because of the world or something like that, that is something that is uh, so sad because they knew the truth but didn't follow it. Christians, true Christians, that know what they ought to do should do that. And they shouldn't look like the world. They should look distinctly like how God demands and uh, desires Christians to be. So I ask you, will you do as the Lord commands and witness to the lost? And will you put away anything that would hinder you from being the best witness possible so that you can be a witness that they see God is with that person and they see I want to be like that person because I know that there's something different. They're happy in times of trial. That is only by the grace of God. So will you put away all that would hinder you and 
odd. Go and reach the lost. Teach those that are saved so that they might not head towards the world, but that they would see Christ growing in them.